Hi, everyone. Uh, we are ready to get started. Uh, Baltimore City Council Ways and Means Committee. Uh, we are back for City Council Ordinance 21 0080. Uh, get my script here with me. I said this 20 times this week, so I should remember. Council Bill 21 0080, the ordinance vestments for the fiscal year ending June 30, 2022. I am Eric Castello, Councilman from the 11th District Chair of the Committee. I'm joined in chambers by Councilwoman Danny McRae, 2nd District Member of the Committee, and Councilman Robert Stokes, 12th District Member of the Committee. Also joining us is Councilman Chris Burnett, 8th District Member of the Committee, Councilman Isaac Gitsy Schleifer, 5th um, District Member of the Committee, uh, Councilman Mark Conway, 4th District, Councilman Ryan Dorsey, 3rd District Member of the Committee. Uh, we have on behalf of Mayor Brandon Scott, Natasha Mehu and Nina Themelis. And on behalf of Council President uh, Nick Mosby, we have Matt Stegman and Nikki Thompson. Uh, Marguerite Curran is staffed to the committee. Uh, we are here for uh, BMZA, the Board of Municipal and Zoning Appeals. Uh, this is our 6 p.m. session. Uh, and we have the last agency for the evening will be Department of Transportation from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. Uh, we have Katie Byrne uh, with us uh, this evening, who is on loan uh, to PMZA or within DHCD, but from DHCD. Uh, also joining us this evening is City Administrator uh, Chris Shorter, uh, as well as Budget Director uh, Bob Sename. Uh, with that, Katie, I am going to turn it over to you. You're on mute. Thank you, Councilman Costello. Uh, small little agency that we are. We are only a five person agency and we have one service number 185 and our fiscal recommended budget is $485,660. For those of you who do not know, as far as the function of the BMZA, we are serve as the um, it's a quasi judicial agency that hears zoning related land use matters, also municipal appeals. Um, and we have a, again, small little agency, um, only five people, and we have a board that works as the BMZA. So happy to answer any questions anyone has about our budget. Absolutely. Uh, Schleifer first. Dorsey, you look like you had a question. Uh, curiosities. Well, well, we'll go with questions first and curiosities later. Councilman Schleifer. Yeah, um, well, I guess my question is also a pretty curious question. Um, so why is it showing that budget, the budget being cut by over 15% uh, when you guys have such a backlog currently at BMZA, which is stalling development all across the city? I believe the reason why there's a difference between um, last year's budget and this year's budget is was a COVID related impact. We had uh, five individuals, two zoning officers, one assistant counsel, one legal assistant, and then the executive director. Oh, we lost one of our zoning officer positions during COVID um, working with BBMR. Um, to, to see what we can do as far as moving forward with that. So I think that's why you see the budget cut there. Right, so, um, and first of all, look, I, I appreciate what you're doing. I appreciate the fact that you're willing to go on loan there. Uh, so don't don't get me wrong on that, but um, from Cal what you're Councilman, seeing- Councilman, can I, can I interrupt just for one second? Sure. Um, I, I think there's a, the, there's there's probably a narrative here around some of the staffing issues, just in all fairness to Katie, that I would, if it's okay with you, Councilman, I would ask to give Katie an opportunity to kind of explain the transition from Derek to, to LeVu and, and how we got to the point where Katie's essentially uh, uh, on on loan or being held hostage by, by BMZA for the, for the interim, just so we can kind of level set because um, I have those same frustrations that you do. I'm, council. I'm, aware, I'm aware of the answer, but if you know, if you want to explain it to the other council people, that's fine. Yeah, I think, I think that'd be helpful. Yeah. I think you're right. 100% it would be helpful. Um, for those of you who know the history of the BMZA, it's uh, for those of you who remember Dave Tanner was here as executive director for the BMZA for a good 20 plus years. And Derek served, I believe, 
Derek Baumgartner, who was the previous executive director of the BMZA, served as his assistant counsel for approximately five years. Um, in right, I guess at the beginning of COVID, office was fully staffed. We had Derek Baumgartner, who was the executive director, uh, Lavu, who acted as associate counsel. We had two zoning officers and a legal assistant. Derek, who was the former executive director, left city employment in July. Lavu, who was the associate counsel, was serving as acting for a period of time. She left city employment at the end of January. In addition, we had we lost a zoning officer who left city employment, and we had a longtime zoning officer, Bob Henry, who was with the city for 30 years, most of it in the BMZA, retired at the end of January. So one of the challenges facing the agency right now is essentially staff, right? We have two permanent staff right now. We have a zoning officer who started at the end of January. We have a legal assistant who started in October. I've pulled one of the lawyers from DHCD Code Enforcement Legal up with me to act as associate counsel. We've just advertised for that position so we can get a permanent attorney in there to act as counsel as the board and also uh, um, draft the resolutions. You know, again, I think one of the difficulties that we're facing right now is all of our staff are brand new. Uh, I think one of the reasons why I was asked to come over from DHCD is because I've been around for a little bit. I worked closely with Derek and with Dave Tanner, as well as our zoning administrator. So my goal right now um, sitting in this chair is to make sure that the trains continue to run, that we get hearings scheduled. We schedule as quickly as possible. We get as many hearings on the docket as we can and to create efficiencies where I think we can find efficiencies. I think one of the other challenges facing this agency is that it's a paper process that hasn't changed in a really, really long time, but there was never a need for it to change because the door was always open. People were used to the process. They would come in and have conversations. And because it was a small agency, the relationships were developed and it was there was always an open door policy with COVID and going remote. Um, I think we've done a really good job at switching to virtual hearings and now we're going to take those next steps to start putting more things online and and making our agency move forward in a more electronic manner. So I think I think one of the frustrations or that that people have maybe with our agency right now is stems from staffing and we're taking steps to correct that. Thank you. Can I resume, Mr. Chair? Yeah, yes, please. So, and thank you for your indulgence, Councilman. I do appreciate it. No problem. Thank you for that explanation. I mean, it's it's certainly appreciated what you're doing over there. And, you know, if you continue to do such a good job, you might get stuck there. But <laughs> uh, in the meantime, in the meantime, I think, you know, you hit the nail on the head, which which clearly there's a staffing um, there's a staffing issue there. And we're talking about so few people, uh, but you know, so few people have such a large impact on the city. I mean, I just, I see just for my district alone, how much longer it's taking uh, because of that for, for things to move forward. And also um, just getting on the agenda and then just, you know, every step along the way. Um, and so what I'm seeing, like when I just do the basic math about, you know, stalling certain projects out two months, three months, or, you know, things getting backlogged or not being on the next agenda. And I appreciate, you know, that you guys are always trying to, you know, trying to get things moving along. And so I don't, I'm not faulting you for this. I'm just, you know, doing the simple math and the simple math tells me that just the projects I know about alone, us receiving a tax, the, the tax assessment for those properties and for those projects alone will cover these additional people. And so when I saw that you guys actually are getting a 15% cut from last year to this year, I was actually blown away by that because in my mind, I was like, you guys should be getting a 15, 30% increase just to get things moving because you guys actually are driving development in the city. And what, what, what ultimately does happen in some scenarios, not, not most, but in some, is that by stalling a project out could eventually you know, end up killing that project for whatever the reason may be, whether it be COVID, whether it be lumber prices. Um, so I know of, of of projects in my district that because of the wait time and because of, you know, some of those factors now with lumber prices going up, they're stalling out on those projects. But, you know, somebody builds an addition on their house and increases their assessment by $100,000, 
you know, waiting three months extra to get that process moving, you know, it's costing the city serious money when you start adding it all up. So can you tell us what, from your experience, from the short time you were there, what would it take to get things moving the most efficiently and effectively, like for a reasonable turnaround time, what would need to happen? Well, I think we're starting to look at other avenues, right? We're getting staff trained. Like I said, it's a brand new staff. We're getting staff trained. We're working forward to try to create efficiencies within our own internal processes, which I think we've done a good job with that. I think one of the benefits of me coming from DHCD is I know where the application process starts and the application process starts with the zoning administrator. So there's this point person that where the application starts. So I'm working with Jason Hessler's team and Jeff Veal to see, well, where can we change that process? Where can we cut days down from the beginning of the application, get things to BMZA faster so we can get things scheduled faster? One of the conversations that I've had also with planning is to make some changes to the zoning code so that it doesn't necessarily have to go to the zoning administrator first. We know that there are certain applications that have to come to the BMZA. So creating that extra stop at the beginning of an application, all that does is create delay for the applicant, right? So we're looking at ways to create efficiencies, whether it's changes in the code or is it changes in process. And Right now, one of the things that um, I'm looking at and working with Jeff Veal is on variances, right? So there's a little bit of subjectivity sometimes with the variance application. What kind of variance is it, right? So if we can create more predictability in the application process, that will cut down on time. So it's looking at from, from soup to nuts, right? If I am have a development and I am filling out this application, I'm walking myself through that process from the time that I fill it out, how I fill it out, how I make my payment, does it go to the zoning administrator, what his what is his process there, and then how long does it take to get to BMZA? Because I think there's there's we can save some time there and we can save some process there. And um, so, so it's, we're in those stages of where can we slice and dice and create more efficiencies. And that doesn't create extra staff, right? That's just a change in process and educating us um, on how to do things better. So that's, that's what we're looking at right now. Um, and I think that will also help for us to continue to process. So, so on that, is there is there a set amount of, of staffing uh, in addition to what you have now that you would need just to deal with what we have going on? Um, I'm working with finance and BBMR to kind of identify what our hours look like, right? What's our what's our man hours? So what does it really take for us to take an application from the beginning, prepare the staffing report and get it on the agenda? And so um, I'm working on that to make a determination as to what our staffing needs might be um, coming forward. So right now, I think I'm gonna create some serious efficiencies in how we get cases to us. And I'll be working with, with BBMR to look to see, you know, what changes may need to be made in the future. So if this cut did not happen, would you have use for that person? <laughs> We can uh, always use people. Can, can, but, I jump in here and, can I jump in here and clarify something about when you are saying a cut? So if 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 you look at page 166 of the agency detail volume two, um, you know what? There's a change table in that chapter that shows you the difference between last year's budget and the recommended budget, and the the number is lower this year, but there were adjustments. Um, that don't necessarily have a service impact here. And so there was an adjustment for, you can see one was adjustment for health benefit costs. That's just based on what the employees elect for their coverage. There's uh, an adjustment on compensation, presumably because the, the you know, executive director uh, left at a, at a more senior position and left in the salary reset to a lower level. So I just wanna clarify, when we say cut this year, there's no change in the number of positions. Now, last year there was, so from fiscal 20 to fiscal 21, there was a reduction of one position in the BMZA, and that was COVID related, just like a lot of agencies lost positions that happened to be vacant at the time. You know, looking back on it, that was, a, you know, a, a kind of a crude method to go about and finding savings in the budget, um, and it did impact BMZA, but just want to be clear from this year, to, from 20, from 21 to 22, 
the dollar amount is lower, but it's the same level of service um, we're proposing, which admittedly is a is a very tight budget um, for a small agency like this. All right, and I appreciate you pointing that out, Bob, um, on that, and I think that you know we should reward good behavior. That when when there is you know when there is such a dramatic reduction, that and especially in an agency like BMGA that needs um, that extra manpower in that one position makes a world of a difference. Um, that's definitely something that I think should be considered. Um, and can I just ask one quick follow up on that, Chairman? So the one one quick follow up is: is there any way? That in the short term, that the meetings get you know get extended or something like that, so that we're not kicking a uh, an application down an additional month, you know, rather have these you know people don't, the the board members of BMZ get paid right, right? They receive a stipend. Yeah, so I mean, so I think you know maybe we should make them work for it a little bit more this year, and you know extend those meetings a little bit so that more applications could be heard. Um, is right. that something that you guys can consider, at least in the short term, until we get through the backlog? It is. It is. And I think one of the reasons why we had issues as well is during the transition, uh, we had to re we had to actually cancel a hearing, so we had to reschedule. I went back and I took a look at what our average hearing numbers were for 2018, 2019, and 2020. In 2018, we had about 25, it was averaging 25 cases on the docket. 2019, it was actually under. 20 cases on the docket uh, in 2020 averaging around 20. We've been trying to schedule at a hit 20 or a little bit above for each one of our dockets. My goal is to try to increase that number so we can get additional cases on the docket. So I hear what you're saying. We are we are striving to add more. Uh, when I first started, we only put about 16 on the docket just because, like I said, we only had two full time staff. So now we've ratcheted up to 20. We're getting 25 um, cases on the docket as we're coming forward. We're trying to move um, cases that are an emergency where um, people have either funding is being held up or there are other permits and issues that are ready to go. We're trying to expedite certain cases to the best that we can. But yes, we will we will absolutely increase the number of cases that we have on a docket. Thank you. Colleagues, <clears throat> Councilman Dorsey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Katie, just thanks so much for stepping into the role, of course. Uh, and I think you're doing great. And um, like you said, you bring a lot of um, important understanding from your background at DHCD. Just really happy to have you there. Uh, and looking forward to the operational efficiencies and changes that you're uh, you're working on. Uh, I appreciate you really recently meeting with me and the uh, zoning administrator and Jason Hessler and behavioral health systems of Baltimore on an issue that comes up so often um, with communities where uh, group homes, transitional homes, um, and other residential facilities are coming into neighborhood houses. Uh, this, of course, you know, causes an uproar for a lot of people and we get a lot of emails about that stuff. And, uh, you know, in the course of an hour or so, we were really able to work through some pretty big communication gaps that existed between behavioral health systems and the various city agencies. Um, of course, we had Laurie Feinberg in that meeting as well. Um, and, uh, you know, I feel like we like really made some headway there. So I just, and, and of course, I think that would not have happened if you weren't kind of wearing multiple hats with kind of uh, so much uh, breadth of experience that you bring to the table. So just that was really great. Um, I just had a question about sure. um, uh, how many municipal appeals come to the board that, that are not zoning appeals. I mean, uh, I, zone, zoning appeals, variance appeals are kind of in that same same realm. What other kind of municipal appeals come and how? what portion of the docket does that make up? Sure. So the way that the BMZA schedules their docket is the two other municipal appeals that are currently heard by the BMZA are alley and footway appeals. So Department of Transportation issues a notice of violation for the condition of a sidewalk or an alley, and they give the homeowner the opportunity to, to repair that, or they give them the notice, the homeowner doesn't respond, and the 
the city goes out through DOT and replaces the sidewalk or replaces the alley. And then the homeowner is charged for that amount. The homeowner has the opportunity to appeal both the notice, first goes to DOT, and if DOT says, nope, our notice is good, you can appeal the valid, whether that notice is valid or not, to the BMZA. If you have been charged for work either in an alley or a footway and you're objecting to that charge, you can also appeal that. So the alley and footway appeals are heard by the BMZA quarterly. We have approximately, there's probably a hundred or so um, heard every year. So approximately 25 to 30 that are heard. Um, and usually two board members sit on that. I think our next one coming up is on June 24th. And we also hear false alarm appeals and false alarm appeals come from DHCD and the police generate X number of false alarms. You get a free pass, I want to say, for the first two and after the third false alarm, you are charged for it. So you have the ability to appeal whether or not you've been charged with a false alarm to the BMZA. And those, those are sporadic, so it really depends on the data that's received by DHCD from um, BPD and to the number that come before the board. Zoning appeals, which is the bulk of what I think everybody recognizes that the board does, those hearings are held every other week. So we have 26 hearings every other Tuesday. They start 1230 board meetings. They go from one until whenever they finish. And the interesting thing about that is you never know how long it's going to take. Sometimes you could have 25 cases on a docket and we'll be done in two hours. Sometimes you could have 15 cases on a docket and we're there till six o'clock at night. Um, it just depends on whether or not there's opposition to a particular appeal and the amount of time that it takes for testimony. So those are the other municipal appeals. And I, I also want to say that at one time in the past, the board also heard appeals for late night commercial operators licenses as well but we don't hear those currently. Thank you, that's interesting. I didn't know all that. Um, uh, I, um, my colleague a moment ago suggested perhaps tongue in cheek that we should make these uh, board members uh, work for their stipend how much are they paid? Because they do, they really do. They show up and they have no idea how long it's going to take, and they get stuck with homework if they've got to read a case file or something like that. I mean, they, these folks are they work for it. They do. And Katie, real quick, just to add on the councilman's question, where do they get paid? Where does the funding to pay them yeah, come out? Because of? it's not in this budget. Uh, yeah. So it doesn't, um, and I might defer to Bob on this one as well. It doesn't, I think at one time it showed as general payroll costs a few years ago, but it's not, I believe it might be other personnel costs. And it's it's literally an annual stipend. And there are five board members. And the way that generally we the board will receive the full docket um, a week ahead of time. So they receive every single application that comes in. They receive the agenda. Uh, we give them a brief summary. We make sure that they understand what the legal issues are presented before them for that particular docket. And most, I mean, I would say it's volunteer. For, for what I understand, the stipend is not very large, but it's literally 26 meetings a year. These are professional individuals. I think most of our board right now is made up of attorneys, so they essentially take an entire day away from their practice, and they sit um, as, as a member of the BMZA, and they spend time outside of the practice preparing for hearings. Uh, so it's, it's um, the city gets their money's worth from the board members. And just to clarify, you're, you're, you're right, Kathleen, the, the stipend is paid out of the BMZA budget. It's in object two, um, other personnel costs. They, they, if you look at the fiscal 20 budget shows um, 10 positions and then only four in fiscal 21, but that was because we, you know, we made an effort to, for consistency purposes, to only show full-time equivalents in the budget. You know, showing 10 positions in, in BMZA was a little misleading because I believe four or five of them were the actual board members. So that was a change that you saw across the budget in the 21 budget. But uh, you are correct that that small stipend does get paid out of out of this budget. Right, and it's and so we. What is that full stipend, Bob? I, I don't I don't know the exact amount. We can have that as a well, follow up, unless Kathleen, you know. Right, I well, do. It's one. It's one. It's the sorry to intervene. It's. 
isn't it the 151 for other it's object number two right other personnel costs well that there's a lot of things in object two there's other benefits in there so it's a sub object within object two so we'd have to look that up and and send that over to you right I'm not 100% sure what the annual stipend is. So just so you know, we have five um, positions on the board and there are two alternates. And the two alternates when we need them to serve are paid basically per diem. So again, that comes out of that second line item, but I'm not 100% sure what their annual stipend is, um, but I'm happy to get back to you on that. Thanks, I didn't even know we had alternates. I suppose that they are were they nominated and confirmed by the council sworn in like the rest of them? I believe that they are. And one of the reasons why we have alternates is because the state law and the city charter requires that we have five board members. We can't hold a hearing without four. And we need three votes in order for a decision to move forward. So if we have four board members, um, we're allowed to continue to go ahead and have a hearing. So having those alternates is is crucial um, in the event someone has an emergency or you know in the summertime when people are on vacations or if we're down board members. Mr. Chair, I appreciate you indulging me kind of perhaps going over my allotment. Thank you. Pleasure is all mine, Councilman. Uh, Bob, while we're on that topic, um, how do we do just out of curiosity? How do we do the uh, the liquor commissioners? Does that come out of the other personnel cost object? I suppose I can save that question until we get to the liquor board. Yeah, yes, I believe it's done this the same way, but I, okay. I, I need to double check that. Got it. Uh, colleagues questions. Councilman Stokes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm I'm glad um, city administrator Chris Short is on here because. I'm learning like he's learning that there's not a lot of communication between agencies. So since this COVID happened and the agencies coming back, it's starting to happen. And I'm glad Mr. Shorter, because I know that's what his focus is. But Ms. Byrne, I wanted to ask you, how many employees before COVID were you had in your in the office? Do you know that? Or five. So there were, I believe either four or five. I'm not a hundred percent sure when we lost that second zoning. Um, administration position. So the beginning of 2020, I believe there were five positions, the executive director, legal assistant, um, associate counsel, and two zoning officers. So now count you as three or two. Well, there are two full-time staffers in me. And like I said, um, I dragged one of the lawyers from DHCD upstairs with me uh, just to help out just so that we wouldn't fall too far behind with resolutions. He'll be going back downstairs July 1, because uh, we have full dockets at DHCD, but we're aver we've already advertised for that associate council position. So right now there's there's three of us officially. So my question is, I know um, Bob got on to say it wasn't really a cut and Bob's having COVID and getting, getting behind with these on the dockets. Is it that you probably would need to hire more people even with the ones that's missing to even catch up with what's going on? Because only saying that because we're doing a budget and right. maybe we get Mayor Mr. Uh, Shorter right. to look at maybe you need to hire some additional people plus the people that's not there to catch up with the work that y'all been behind on. I think one of the things that I have to do is really do that kind of deep level analysis. I mm -hmm. can't really say at this position right now where I am after only being there for a couple of months what's really needed and this is where I think I have an opportunity to work with finance and like I said let's see what we can do um, without hiring. Let's see what we can do as far as making certain changes uh, to processes and um, to see where that gets us. But I understand exactly where you're coming from. And it was interesting. I looked at just before I came, I looked to see the number of cases filed um, from January 1 of 2020 through just June 1st, 2020 versus this year. And we're up uh, significantly, obviously a number of cases, because you figure three months of last year, people probably weren't able to file cases, didn't necessarily know how to file cases. So I think that we had a dip in the number of cases filed just because of COVID and because of how we had to make changes. I can't tell if it's an increase now or if this is a norm. And I think that's, I need to spend a little more time looking at the data to make that determination. Okay, I'm gonna just make one statement. <clears throat> I hope you're not saying you don't need no additional staff. I would never say that, <laughs> Councilman Stokes. So, but but <laughs> <laughs> but 
but I, I also don't want to, I don't want to mislead the council and say know. that, you know, I need 20 people tomorrow, that kind of thing. It's just, I think it's, it's unfair um, for me to, to say that because I just, I just don't know. And we're functioning, we're functioning well. I think all things considered with our little five person agency and with the assistance of, of, you know, DHCD willing to share um, some of their staff until we can get fully staffed. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Uh, Katie, can you give us a, a snapshot of where the backlog is exactly in terms of appeals? In terms of appeals, um, I would say right now our backlog has to, it's, it's between our office and the zoning administrator's office. So the zoning administrator, and this is something that DHCD is working on, they're also short staffed, but they have advertised. And the reason they're short staffed is because we've had several people retire. Um, in that office. So I think it, it's, I think both the zoning administrator's office and the BMZA had long time staff. I mean, we're talking 20, 30 year staff members and the retirement has just happened for a lot of people this year. And I think once the zoning administrator's office can get fully staffed and I can figure out how to make some of those efficiencies, we'll be able to catch up. And it's, um, and I'm working on how to manage the data, I think, a little bit better at the BMZA side. I think, as I said in the beginning, it's been a paper operation for 50 years. So making sure that we are truly documenting how things are coming in, what the process is, and capturing it so that we can make sure we're not missing anything, per se, um, as applications come in. So yeah, I'm, we're still in that, in that process right now. So I'm, I'm hopeful in the next couple of months, we'll, I'll have a real handle on what that backlog looks like. And I, I think it probably makes sense next year to have this, this conversation jointly with the zoning administrator's office, just because of the, you know, right. you guys, one can't exist without the other, right? A hundred percent. And we have actually made some amendments to the zoning code. Because, um, like I said, right now, every single thing that comes to the BMZA has to go to the zoning administrator. And I don't think that's necessarily has to be the case, but that's how it was originally designed. Remember, you know, in 2017, when Transform passed, it was, you know, apples and oranges from what we had before. So we knew at that time, some things would work well, some things might not. And I think when you know you have to go to the BMCA, if it's a non-conforming use, if it's a um, conditional use, if it's a negative appeal of the zoning administrator, why do you go to the zoning administrator? Why create that step? So, but the code says you have to right now. The zoning administrator is the gatekeeper for all things zoning. And making just a few changes to the code, I think will expedite those conditional uses, those negative appeals, those non-conformities and signs. Like any type of sign that that is outside of the confines of what's permitted in the zoning code has to go to the BMZA. So why are we creating this extra step? Now at the time in 2017, when transform was passed, you know, we didn't necessarily think of the zoning administrator as a log jam. We thought of it as a hub, right? But now what I, you know, there's no reason to go to the zoning administrator when the code tells you you have to go to the board. So I think creating some of those changes will get things on the docket faster and not overwhelm the zoning administrator's office. They can really and truly focus on variances. Um, looking at minor variances, looking at major variances, I think it will free that office up and then the process will change for BMCA as well. Katie, where are we at um, in terms of an ordinance to, to make those changes? Very, very close from what I understand. Um, I made my changes to Title V a couple of weeks ago. I know it's with planning. Um, I think it's, fine. it's looking at final touches right now before it's reintroduced. Um, can you make sure that uh, the council president's office, as well as uh, council vice president Middleton, who chairs our um, uh, ECD committee, are, are briefed on that before it's it's introduced. Absolutely, that would yeah. be immensely helpful. Right. Thank you, yeah. colleagues. Any other questions, Mr. Chair? I just have one quick statement. Yes, um, please. Thanks, um, uh, Katie. I think you're again doing amazing, Ms. Byrne. You're doing an amazing job, but I have to speak up for the housing folks, DHCD, they do not want you to stay there. So <laughs> every time we bring it up, they're like, no, she's on loan, you know? So right. I want to make sure to speak up for my uh, colleagues that they want you back. 
Right, I appreciate it. I'm I'm a I'm a serious zoning nerd, so I think that's one of the other reasons why they put me up here. Um, so it's uh, I was the zoning nerd down there, now I'm just the zoning nerd on the ninth floor. So that's yeah. yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Absolutely, colleagues. Any other questions? Um, Katie, thank you for all the great work. Uh, sure. The administrator shorter. Um, I know you can't figure out a way to clone Katie, uh, but in the meantime, uh, you've heard the concerns around uh, staffing. So anything that, that your office can do to, to help expedite around uh, staffing at both BMCA and the zoning administrator's office and, and make that a priority, I'm, I'm certain would be appreciated. Uh, so really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us uh, today, Mr. Administrator. Uh, we are now in recess and we will be back at 7 p.m. sharp for DOT. Thank you. Thank you.